Dan as uh, the CEO and founder of Everledger, as well as the chief entrepreneur of Queensland. Um, but here's the other thing. We've just uh, realized she's got another title. She is the head of GSD, Get Shit Done. And I completely am on board with that. Welcome, Leanne. Hi, Hi Sandra. Sandra. What a way to start the morning. I'm only one coffee in and what an introduction. Normally there are letters of people's names. And so, yeah, that's a great way to have a few letters, I guess, <laughs> GSD. Well, look, I would love for you to talk a bit about how you see the global supply chain world, tell us a bit about Everledger. But before we kick off, I really want to talk about how we met because um, you hold a special place in my heart. When I was at CME back in, I think it was 2015, I, it, it was a while ago, um, you, you met with us in London. You might have been one of the first blockchain companies that I ever met while sitting in my seat at CME. And I remember you showed up with your laptop and you talked about the diamond industry and blockchain and I was just blown away. Remember that? I do remember that actually. It was uh, me and a laptop and it would have been probably the first month of Everledger's inception. So it was very early in the journey and I don't know that much has changed since that day. Uh, certainly there are more people with more laptops running around the world, ever legends as we say, but um, the same challenges that we sought to solve uh, is exactly the purpose of Everledger. We've seen so many companies start in 2015 in the blockchain space, cryptocurrency, uh, public, private, you know, on-chain, off-chain, all sorts of flavors of ice cream, but we've managed to stay strong to the core purpose and drive out now a pretty interesting platform. So um, before you deep dive into Everledger, I know you guys just had your five year anniversary. So congratulations with your Everlegends all over the world doing great work. Tell us a little bit about sort of your path because you're a serial entrepreneur. You have a really amazing background and history. And frankly, um, it would be lovely if you just spent a few minutes talking about how you got into tech, how you became an entrepreneur. Um, I, like most things we sort of fall into situations and then try and work out how to sink or swim. So I am a serial entrepreneur. I guess uh, when I look back on the career pathway, if you want to call it that, I'm unemployable. Unemployable by virtue of my attitude, sometimes the way I speak. I'm not necessarily well positioned in any hierarchical order. Um, but I've always been really curious about challenges or problems to be solved. And um, at the true essence of Everledger is exactly that. We framed a new and understood exactly the challenge or the problem within an industry and then married the technology. I'm a self-taught engineer um, and yet again uh, have had the better part of 10, 15 years experience in multiple disciplinary technologies. RFID in the mid 90s, which is radio frequency identification was as exciting as blockchain was to the world in 2014. Um, and yet we saw it not really fulfill its true purpose or potential. So um, that experience has sort of led on to uh, a patchwork quilt of experience that's enabled me to be able to see the problem and the challenge for what it is and then marry the, uh, marry the technology, the potent power of that technology to that challenge. But it's all about the timing, I guess. To be a great entrepreneur, people talk about, is it raising capital, is it building a team? And all those are important. But unless you get the timing right, then right. you're either building something too early or you're building a team too big. And it's all about the timing. So to perfect timing is really the greatest uh, gift that an entrepreneur can give itself. Um, but it's also the greatest skill set that a great entrepreneur builds. Amazing. Interesting. And in terms of um, where we are today, we can't ignore the fact that we have some pretty tight, uh, pretty significant shifts in uh, the world. And I'm not just talking about the pandemic, but certainly the pandemic is something that's affecting all of us. But with respect to wherever Ledger is in time right now, where give us some insights into how you're seeing the global supply chain world and how Everledger uh, is navigating, you know, some of the challenges that we're seeing right now. So three major things occurred uh, to me in the journey of Everledger. One, the founder of the company. Secondly, um, being appointed as a global chair for the World Economic Forum in advanced manufacturing, and of course on the Futures Council for blockchain and with circular economy. And the third is the appoint 
as Queensland's chief entrepreneur. So it's a government role. So I hold an office in our state government here. Now, it's that spectral view uh, or that kaleidoscope view that gives me the ability to see the global, the global and local shifts and movements that are occurring. Um, right. And it also uh, is really interesting when we think about where change occurs. Uh, it change occurs at the point of um, the concentric circle overlay. So public-private partnerships are needing to rethink the ways upon which um, the social contracts that we make as citizens to ourselves and our wider citizens, the fact that um, capitalism as it's in its finest form, uh, that needs to be rethought, not just about shareholder value, but you know, stakeholder value and including people and planet as a part of that. So these are huge tectonic plate shifts um, that are occurring. And we know and understand what it means in the physicality of the world when a tectonic plate shifts. Um, mm. Cities literally fall into the oceans. Uh, and, uh, and I guess from a social um, perspective, we're seeing those tectonic plate shifts now play out in various ways. Um, and perhaps in some respects, um, the way upon which we work in a distributed form with distributed teams and this type of technology to bring truth, trust and transparency was always bound to be the new normal. So I do feel as though parts of the world are catching up to where we have all been operating, um, whether that be in the ways of working, because, you know, we've always worked in a way that is distributed by nature. And now we've been forced upon us in the physicality of time to actually um, now sort of strengthen out and be that connective tissue across the globe, particularly with technology. And also just the entrepreneurs in this space feel like they've built more than resiliency. They've gone into this anti-fragility, you know, that muscle strength that you build out over time. Great. Well, really appreciate um, you giving a optimistic and more hopeful view of sort of where blockchain is in this world. As you said, I think, um, you know, in many ways, blockchain technology was leading up to moments, a moment like this. It's, it's unfortunate that there is, um, you know, as much global suffering as there is. But having said that, um, the opportunity set is significant. Um, trust, the bedrock of almost every interaction that we have, and frankly, our institutions are showing that uh, there could be some improvement in... Um... Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's been really dark moments for me to think, wow, is the, move, is the market moving away from provenance and supply chains and digital rails? Or is it moving closer to us? And it's, that tectonic plate shift is the interesting part. Um, the timing is most definitely now. So the compressed nature of which the challenges are all coming at us in various forms will eventually tip that axis and will actually start to change the kind of the, ta the table of balance um, per se. But I will say that, um, you know, diamonds in the supply chain and diamonds physically stopped mid COVID because there's such hyper consolidation um, in supply chains across the diamond and gemstone industry. Uh, and we, of course, are a digital rails. We're a digital twin representation of physicality of supply chain. But there's also really interesting rethinking of manufacturing and how we bring digital rights um, out into the forefront of just being able to get PPE and or being able to print medical devices um, when typically the rights holder of those designs are sitting only in one or two locations in the world. But, you know, the risk to the citizens to not enable the production to continue, um, of course, is no greater travesty than death. So it was a have to do. So we think about innovation in various forms. How do you, uh, when is the time upon which innovation truly rises? And it's where there's a true existential crisis. That's when change moves into a transition. And so we're in this time where we know we need to change. And there's this paradigm, this third axis of recovery. It's not about just stopping the clocks and opening the economy back up again. There's now a Z axis that we're walking along. The CEO of Microsoft said it well, two years of digital transformation has now happened in two months. Um, and the amount of engineering that's gone into getting even uh, LinkedIn channels like this with Zoom, uh, a strengthening of cybersecurity, you know, that was a had to do. The existential crisis was faced. Right, absolutely. And, um, you know, you work around the world, but let's face it, you do uh, provenance in some really interesting commodities and, um, 
it takes you to some pretty tough parts of the world. Can you talk a little bit about um, whether you see an opportunity set more for the, you know, I, I hate this term, but developing countries versus those that have, you know, um, existing infrastructure and sort of kind of stayed in their way, it might be harder to break some of those legacy uh, infrastructure and systems. How do you do that? Like, yeah, that, I mean, that's such a big, um, that's a, such a big question to be asked with only half a cup, cup of coffee in the morning. Um, <laughs> I'd have to say, I would have, yeah, look, I would have to say, we've seen incredible digital transformations bring about um, massive leaps in prosperity in various parts of the world and point to China as a prime example. You think about the giants that sit within China, whether it be Tencent or Alibaba, and just yeah. the digital rails upon which they built their banking system or their consumer interaction system, regardless of whether we're going to sit here and have a debate around um, citizen surveillance or not, the reality is that the prosperity of that country has risen uh, quite dramatically. I hold a lot of hope for the world that the superpowers that were in the last decade, that mm -hmm. tectonic plate shift is also occurring. Watch out, you know, for other... Um, sectors of the world, for example, Africa, when we think about ASEAN and the countries like Malaysia and, um, and, and Thailand and Singapore, you know, this part in the belt of that part of the world, and even in Chile, um, mm. to be able to leap over the legacy of systems, the legacy of policy, um, that truly is the change-making time that we're going to face. And on the backdrop of the power of the people that exist in these nations, it's quite outstanding. What this technology does, and we've proven it already with our work in Tanzania with gemstones, coloured gemstones, um, is the ability to be able to bring entirely origin markets that were once hidden and opaque, even conflicted, directly up into the source of value, uh, whether that be the large luxury goods markets in Milan and Paris and even New York. But mm -hmm. Um, there needs to also be a shift in the consciousness of consumers. Uh, and that's the piece of work that as a collective nature, and maybe this is the time where these social contracts for rights um, uh, comes into, into the forefront and play. It's not always about what's just in front of you. Ask the question about, well, what's just behind that shadow or what's casting that shadow? And I think this is the technology that will help to bring the windows uh, into those moments in time. Absolutely. Um, you know, if I um, just go back to basics a little bit, because you mentioned circular economy and a couple of different terms and maybe for the audience, for the benefit of the audience. Can you um, talk a bit about, in layman's terms, what does circular economy mean and, and why should people want to embrace a circular economy? So the economics of the world, uh, which came out of the Industrial Revolution, was um, production-based, manufacturing-centred, and it's take, make, and dispose. So I take it, I use it, and I throw it in the bin. Um, the reality of the moment is we have so much finite resources, but the cost of waste is a huge externality, and it's externality cost that is not necessarily built into this product. Um, what's built into this product is the first time manufacturing costs, not necessarily the cost of the waste that it, that it occurs. Right. In the rise of the last century, just at the turning of the you know, 2020 clock, we saw a huge amount of concerns around climate and environment. The basics of the circular economy look to reuse, repurpose and recycle. And what once could have been someone's waste could be the input to value. Now, what's really interesting about this is, would you ever think that the largest electronic manufacturers in the world, Dell, Apple, Microsoft, that they could be one of the biggest suppliers to the diamond and jewelry industry. And when, when I sort of said that five years ago, people looked at me and thought, yep, she's crazy again. There she goes with her crystal ball moments. But it's true, as we can strip out metals and minerals from wasteful devices like this, that can be the input stream into an entirely new different supply chain. So we have these really strange bedfellow moments that are being created um, mm -hmm. and they're quite exciting. On top of that, science in its own right is being disrupted. So, you know, Moore's law is being disrupted, the principles of science. And when we start thinking about that, entirely new material science is going to help to elevate and escalate 
what I start calling the movement from natural mining to urban mining. So as we start to think about what's in our bin, as we start to think about what's dug up and put into our, um, into our, into our landfills, that's urban mining. And some of the large mining companies in the world are already investing significant amount of capital in refinery processes. That was once just a dirty side business. Now right. it's become a real centrality to supply chain value. That's amazing. I think you've just blown my mind. I'm going to go through all my electronics now, see what I can run. No dumpster with. diving. No dumpster diving. You'll find all sorts of stuff in there. And Lord knows New York City's got a lot of those. So yeah, yeah. Um, maybe we should form a coalition to do that. I, um, I, I completely agree with you. I think there is something about looking at the world in a much more um, holistic way that we're going to be forced to do anyway. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, your passion for sustainability and obviously the environment and, and the work that you've been doing, um, especially as a government official um, to, you know, to, to promote and to support that? Um, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, there is so much that is happening in the space of climate and environment. And to a certain extent, we've seen it on Hollywood style pizzazz movies. Um, and that's really been talking out for the better part of the last number of decades. Polar bears crying, you know, um, penguins, um, penguins not having a home to go to. Um, and I'm not downplaying the importance of what's happening in terms of climate change. But the transition at the moment is very difficult to make that quantum leap because of the economic strategy, the economic transition strategy. To be able to leave what was once behind, go from that point of, I know I need to change, but do a transition. Um, unfortunately, the incumbents within powers, whether that be governments or even corporations, are entrenched in business models, are entrenched in profit schemes, are entrenched in certain ways upon which the financial markets incentivize and fund that that entire system needs to start to crack to be able to find the space to reform. Um, and the circular economy is the economic engine. For once, it's the business model that makes sense to help drive those changes. And the work that we've been doing at Everledger is not only around the baseline of event enablement for provenance, so where does it go to and track and trace it, but it also right. overlays the footprint. So how has that affected people and planet? And it, yet again, it's a great industry to be able to put this technology towards as a first use case for many more. Diamonds are unique. We also have man-made diamonds that are now being manufactured um, in nuclear type reactors in various parts of the world that are driven not on solar panels with beautiful, um, beautiful harp playing music in the background, yet there are marketing campaigns that are showing this greenwash effect that natural diamonds uh, are evil for the earth, but man-made diamonds are great for sustainability and climate. Um, we need to be able to connect systems, sensors, technology like blockchain and bring all of that together to show its truth and allow the data to show um, the moment in time that uh, we all suspect uh, is, not actually, uh, is not actually right. Uh, and, and we've been able to do that over the course of the last number of years and release that work on Earth Day. So now when we go into a store, Everledger can show where it's come from. We can also ask the question, where does it go after it leaves me in terms of its gold and the refinery process? Uh, and then also the footprint, like what was the CO2? What was the water used? Did it go through a green factory in Surat that's LED certified? How is that factory actually connected to the chain? All of that lies at the heart, the beating heart of the system of Everledger. And we just connect the arteries of supply chains across the world. No, uh, it's, it's incredibly powerful and um, let's face it, it's, it's the direction that we need to go in. Um, I promise to those who are listening and watching, I will be at, uh, sorry, asking the questions that you've got here, but I do want to ask a couple more um, questions before we move on to Q&A. So Leanne, when you think about the work, um, we've heard you've done some great work around um, battery space. Can you talk a little bit about the battery passport and, and the battery industry for those who are just not very familiar with what's going on there? You know, um, I remember being uh, in my late teens watching Leonardo DiCaprio's Blood Diamond movie and it's pretty infamous. It runs around the world. Most people know about it or know of it. Um, and really, it was one tiny moment in time that gave me a motivation fuel to start Everledger. 
But to ask the question, not only where does it come from and then understand Blood Diamonds as a movie, I, we asked ourselves, what is the potentially most conflicted supply chain in the future? If we're able to fix the problems of the past, then why can't we prevent some of the challenges of tomorrow? And as I started to sit and think about this, it's stored energy. The transformation that we're making into electric vehicles, autonomous uh, fleets on the road, the devices. I've got five devices sitting in front of me right now. And each of these have a battery, a lithium ion battery. Now, okay. parts of the supply chain lithium ion comes with the Congo DRC and cobalt. And we know and understand the conflict concerns and opacity and human rights violations that occur in segments of the world that feed up into these supply chains. But it potentially could be one of the largest, most conflicted supply chains in the world by 2030, as we start to bring all of these devices to life on the planet. Wow. So in around 2017, when I um, began working more deeply with the World Economic Forum, the, the um, Global Battery Alliance was born. It's a public-private partnership that saw about $32 million funded and looked at the battery supply chain not only traceability from the source for conflicted metals and minerals, which is the work that Everledger um, set out to do in its first uh, year or so, but it also looked at how could innovation rethink batteries themselves? What type of new rare earths are able to be mined in countries like Australia as a prime example, vanadium. You know, we have vanadium free flow batteries now that are technologies um, that are large scale batteries that can sit on the sides of houses and buildings that take in solar energy. So there's three tiers of work or pillars of work. One in traceability, and we know and understand that a battery um, mm. is not necessarily dead after its first time use. Like even when this only has a charge rate of two hours, and you know, those times you're like, oh, the battery's so dead, I'm just going to throw it out and get a new one. There's still yeah. life in that battery. There's really important metals and minerals. So how do we provide a passport and a traceability to not only the battery itself, but also the components within it? Now, as we start to see electric vehicles, they've got about a 10 to 20 year cycle, depending on the OEM manufacturer. But a battery that's used in a mobile device, so whether that be an electric vehicle or a bus, can actually be repurposed, banked up and put on the sides of buildings. So it's not only about what is the battery itself, but it's the use of the battery. And that gives a whole other low overlay of risk. So therefore insurance companies are really interested in this because they'll have to turn around and think about the declaration of risk of use. That is amazing. I mean, I just, I'm thinking opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Um, okay, well look, it's I am- you know, The Department of Energy in the US, uh, look, put out a battery challenge in both port portables so these types of lithium ion portable electronics, as well as in electric vehicles. And Neverledger won that work and we've begun um, continuing forward on that challenge. So too in Australia, we know and understand we have a future batteries industry being built. This is a trillion dollar opportunity for the globe and blockchain is very well suited to help be one part of that industry solution. Well, I'll tell you right now, I think you've given me some ideas. We should talk later more about um, the space because frankly, I don't know enough about it. And um, you've convinced me that it needs attention at least from uh, my own edification point of view. Before I go to questions though, I'm gonna turn to your role as Queenland's um, chief entrepreneur. I would love if you could just tell us a little bit about what is the Australian tech scene like for those who are not familiar? And um, what's the focus right now these days? Um, I know there's a lot going on, but you know, if you talk a little bit about the Australian tech scene, blockchain, and then obviously, yeah. Um, so Queensland is um, is the state, or it's the home of the Great Barrier Reef. So many people know Australia for its uh, for its beauty, of course, and most uh, trading entities know of Australia for its natural resources. So the fact that we are one of the largest suppliers of natural resources in the world and some of the largest mining companies like Rio Tinto are proudly Australian. Um, the tech scene here is really interesting. We don't do unicorns in Australia. Well, we don't do them in Queensland, definitely. We do zebras, the rare but real creatures rather than the mythical billion dollar ones that come out of nowhere. Um, 
we have the tyranny of distance across Queensland and 44% of our population resides in our regional and town centres and the other half of our population sit in the southeast corner, which is where I, I'm situated. Um, we have, as a okay. government, put $755 million uh, into innovation and that is supported in various programs, not dissimilar to a Silicon Valley program, you know, we do have tech stars here. We have Y Combinator that attracts the talent across the seas. Uh, and we have great trading relationships in around 14 countries of the world. Um, but what is really kind of different about Aussies that are innovators, we're very anchored into what is the definition of the challenge or the problem to be solved. Um, I don't really see many innovators come out and even the science that we uh, are giving birth to. You know, we were one of the first three universities in the world uh, that began looking at the vaccine for COVID. Um, mm. And that was well uh, into the late December, early January timeframe. So well ahead of where most other countries sit. Um, I think we were the first to move into human trials, of course, uh, on the vaccine as well. So we have great underpinning science here. Um, mm. But I would say the thing that lets us down in Australia is we're a bloody long way away. So you've got to fly to get anywhere, at least a day to even get out of the country. Uh, it's a too far to swim. We have a small population in comparison to the larger cities of the world. Um, so therefore most Australians that are scaling will scale out into international locations. We have incredible trade relationships with China and the ASEAN belt. Um, and of course, we're a Commonwealth uh, baby, and we re we relate beautifully into the Five Eyes scheme with the United States. So, we are, you know, we're, we're good mates. We're good mates with most people in the world. So too is New Zealand. Um, the tech scene has seen a couple of those shooting unicorns, for one of a term, uh, Atlassian, uh, which would be one of those companies that are pretty prevalent in the space of project management platforms, and that's hit some pretty good, interesting uh, valuation. And so too is Canva. Um, Canva as well as like the, the, the digital marketing PowerPoint for online services. Yes. Um, so th those companies are fast rising. In Queensland, we're about 35,000 uh, startups, entrepreneurs, innovators across the state. And my role in my government office is to be that connective tissue, to also look back into government and help to advise them on policies, grants, schemes, all sorts of work that needs to be done to keep our entrepreneurs uh, riding and scaling out uh, great companies. Fantastic. Well, really appreciate all that you're doing for Queensland on top of, you know, um, how busy you are at Everledger and also at the World Economic Forum. So I'm going to take some questions here. Get ready. Okay. Got um, one from Manuel saying, um, talking about talent, do you think there is actually enough talent and I guess skill set in blockchain for supply chain management? Um, do we think that there is a supply and demand issue around the actual talent needed in the space? Um, look, this question is such a critical question that should be asked a lot more. When I started Everledger, late 2014, just me with a laptop, there was no such thing as blockchain engineers. It did not exist. The only blockchain engineer that would have been available was Vitalik. But he was kind of busy right then doing what he was doing with Ethereum. And I think actually it was in the beta form and called it Homestead. Um, but where, because I'm an engineer, I was able to understand the componentries of the technologies that were put together. So I think this industry needs to understand and embrace a skills currency that is needed to help underpin and continuously underpin these emerging and evolving technologies. When we look at blockchain, we're like, right, there's database elements. We have incredible database engineers in the world. Um, mm. Cryptography. We have great cryptographers out of universities like the Turing Institute. So in the first year for Everledger, we recognized the skills components that were needed to build a bloody good blockchain team. And out of that, of course, we have fantastic blockchain engineers. Right. Um, so the skills, this jobs for the future, the career pathways, that all that dialogue, I hope, is another one of the skills transitions that I mean, the tectonic plate shifts that need to occur. We need to be thinking about people that have skills and the skills transitioning piece that skills currency um so the quick answer is i don't think we have a skills shortage um i think that we are trying to attract the wrong type of um the wrong type of talent we're trying to fish from a pond that is very shallow 
rather than building the bench strength through the expertise of those that have, you know, 10 and 15 and 20 years engineering skills. This is an engineering feat, regardless of whether it's blockchain or not. Um, and so we have great engineers, seek out engineers. More importantly, STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and maths. We put an E at the front of it, esteem. We need the entrepreneurial, the innovation logic to be running across this as well, particularly when we think about being CEOs and founders of blockchain companies. Um, you know, do a far better job of researching a lot more upfront than just tinkering with the technology and deploying it and hope for the best. We know what it takes to build two-sided marketplaces and we've seen companies in the world strive to trillion dollar valuations. Um, but this is far more complicated than building a two-sided marketplace, particularly when you think about provenance, because it's not just knowing your buyer and your seller, it's knowing your buyer's buyer, your buyer's buyer's buyer, it gives to go right the way back. So it's a multi-dimensional platform and that takes time. Agreed. Agreed. Couldn't agree with you more. So um, we've got a lot of questions here. I'm going to try to, um, I like this one actually, um, from Anonymous. Uh, what part of this revolution are you most excited about? Um, you talked a lot about tectonic shifts and changes that we're going through right now, but if you were to pick one element um, that excites you and gets you out of bed in the morning, energized, what is it? Um, Look, what's really interesting for me is that with the exception of the science to help solve for the vaccine for COVID, most other problems we have in the world today, we have the technology to be able to solve for it. So what I'm most excited about is how we can um, bring a systemic change to society. The social contracts that we hold, um, the appreciation that we hold with planet. So shareholder to stakeholder, supply chains to value chains, um, natural mining to urban mining, circular economy is a prime example of that. Distributed technologies like blockchain. That is what excites me. That world is a very different world. I'm 50, not far off 50. So uh, will I see this by the time I get to a nursing home? I hope. Um, will my children get to see it by the time they are sitting in a chair like me? Damn straight. It's here. We're moving. World Wide Web. Worldwide ledger. Let's hope that blockchain and our technologies and all of the magical work we've been doing in this industry becomes ubiquitous, right? That consumers click on these things, they don't even know that they're using blockchain. That's what we should be really striving for as a collective power. And then that change just happens so persuasively that um, it becomes the new normal. It is now. You have um, dovetailed into uh, the next question I wanted to ask you, uh, which is, you know, if you're a young person, if you are that young person right now watching you talk about blockchain and, and, and the revolution of the, you know, in the future, um, what would you say on, to someone who's actually beginning their journey, would like to figure out how to get into the supply chain side, especially, what advice do you have for that person? I would say, you are sprinting a marathon because the rate of change that's occurring in the world uh, is quite rapid. And so it does take the ability to uh, operate at dis different atmospheric le levels of pressure, um, both physically and of course, you know, uh, in a digital sense as well. So I would say learn how to pace and sprint a marathon. Secondly, be um, build the skill sets around innovation logic. So know and understand how to team up or form teaming. It's an environment, of course, that helps to cluster in like a flock of birds that can coordinate to be able to solve the challenges. And I would say sit in if you're very young, um, become a multi-hyphenate, um, make a pledge to lifelong learnings and ensure that the skill sets that you build can become that patchwork quilt. Like I'm a multi-hyphenate, I can software code, it's very clear that I know and understand the backdrop of how to build a business, run a business, and even more excitingly, exit a business. Um, so become that lifelong pledge to learning and be deliberate in becoming a multi-hyphenate because in the multi-hyphenate world, you're able to bring together these experience sets and see a problem and a challenge and solution right there. 
which is exactly what made us stand out as Everledger so early. Fantastic, thank you for that. Oh, and, and employ women, more women. I will add mother. That. Bring your mother into the business. Diversity all around. I would say getting people from different socioeconomic backgrounds as well as uh, gender diversity. And let's totally. be, if you all hire from the same schools and the same backgrounds, it becomes a very boring um, place to be. So yes, uh, right with you. Got to hire um, as many different minds as possible. Uh, Sophia is a colleague of ours who's on the line. And I believe we are going to open it up for live mic for any of you brave enough. I know a bunch of questions are still typed up, but if any of you brave enough would like to ask live <laughs> here. Yes, thank you, Sandra. You can raise your hands and I will unmute you so you may ask your question. Um, and while you guys are doing that, um, I will ask another question if that's all right, Sophia. Absolutely. Great. Um, so this was an interesting question. I don't know even quite how uh, you go about answering this one. You talked a lot about, uh, you know, hopefully getting consumers to change how they look at their product and where it's coming from and the provenance of that and then changing behaviors based on that um, and hopefully then participating in the circular economy. Someone wrote, Anonymous wrote, is caring about where our products come from of interest only to the elites? Or does this have relevance to folks who are in the lower socioeconomic classes? Look, I, I think it's relevant to everyone. We've seen incredible footage across the world, regardless of where we are on the planet, with plastic straws up the noses of turtles and entire river systems choked with plastic. So if this is not just an elite. Um, certainly, I think that... Um, we have a lot of work to do in governments and even in fabric manufacturers to change labeling. So instead of on a label of a shirt to just see polyester cotton and the percentage and dry clean or dope dry clean, imagine right. the type of decision that you'd make if you flipped the label over and saw how much water was used in the manufacturing of that shirt and you could compare it. So yeah. I don't think it is just about, because the impact that we are having in a take, make, dispose, the currency of the world in terms of its environmental footprint is actually affecting now literally every corner of the globe. So therefore it's the responsibility of every citizen. How every citizen becomes educated and contributes to that change, um, that's the trick, right? That's the issue. And where, um, and where and how can technology companies or the collective power of entrepreneurs come together to enact that change? It's not one single solution. It's not one single technology. It is the collective nature where we can align the value and the values of the world or of an industry or of a supply chain or of a community. And that's the work to be done. And the collective nature of aligning those is, is not technology driven, right? It's the human consciousness. Some people will care about it, some people won't. But when rivers are choked and turtles have straws up their nose and children yeah. in schools are seeing this and championing the change, then that's why this will is an eventuality of change. Hi, Sandra, we have a live question. Do you mind if I put them on? Go for it, thank you. Great, uh, Benoit, I'm gonna unmute you. You may have to unmute yourself on your end as well. Hello, thank Benoit. Hi, Leanne. Hey, Benoit. How are you? I'm fine, and you? I remember you. Exactly the same on your profile. Exactly last time I saw you, I think you were looking like this. You haven't changed a lot in five years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Leanne. You just mentioned the, uh, the provenance and the consciousness of people. In your customer base and what you're doing, how much have you seen the technology and what you are developing being used for branding purposes only? Um, it's an interesting question because parts of the, reg, the governance backbone of the uh, diamond and jewelry industry, the prime example, is both a governance overlay of certification and an embedded brand in its own right. And, you know, uh, the GIA is the name of, of that entity. Um, so, 
I would say it's less about just brand alignment and more now than, uh, than, than an acceptance of the transformation efforts that need to happen across, across the supply chain. Um, diamonds always seem to find their way across the world regardless of whether COVID or not COVID. Um, but the important factor is most of the certification, whether it be in government issuance or not, or in uh, governance vehicles like certification laboratories are still very large um, paper-based driven events. So we don't see other industries like the diamond industry where the governance certification is actually so deliberately connected to brand. They've typically been separated and very separated. Um, but in this instance, you've actually seen an authoritative, um, scientific-based certification authority that is both a very strong front-facing retail brand. So one in the same will actually mean that you are lifting not only the standards of industry, but you're also getting brand penetration in ways that other industries probably can't get in the same shot. Great. Thank you for that. And um, Sophia, if it's all right, I'm going to go to a another um, text question just because we've got quite a few. Yes. Um, there's one related to um, holding politicians more accountable with transparency. <laughs> do Good you luck. Have, do you have any views on that? Daniel would like to know. <laughs> um, you know what's really fascinating to me? I'll just dip back into the world of the US for a moment. But yeah. How interesting is it with your President Trump and the work that is now being undertaken by Twitter, um, by Snapchat, to bring a truth overlay to the commentary or the dialogue that is being, uh, that's being touted? And I think that's a really interesting place in the world where we have tech giants that now are becoming the regulator of the regulator per se. Uh, one would, I would never have imagined that in my life and my form. The reality is that we um, have government elects. They're officials, right? They're elected by the mass of the people. Um, so how do we make them accountable? We make them accountable in good rigid governance uh, environments and regulators, and that's why we have them. We can make them more accountable in terms of data. So how do we enable in a far better way this data to be made seen in a public sense um, and in a safe environment whilst respecting privacy? Um, and then, look, the power of the vote, that's the reality of the moment. And there is a tipping point. This is starting to move and shift and form and reform. We've had eight prime ministers in eight years in Australia. Astonishing. Yeah. I mean, that's saying something. There's, there's a, it's a system that is so badly broken, but there hasn't been a compression of time with such a heightened set of crises all occurring at once where that transition had to change. It's like we know it, we, it's like you're being in a bad marriage for 10 years, I've been there. Um, you just sort of put up with it, hoping that change will occur until there's one great big moment in time, you're like, I'm done, I'm out of here, forget it, done. And I think to a certain extent, the collision of these crises is coming together, climate leading into 2020, COVID, the issues now that we're facing right around the world um, with equality and fairness, um, yep. All of that is coming together in a huge, compactful way. It is certainly a world of change right now. Um, Sophia, interrupt me, but otherwise I'm going to keep going if um, you don't have any other live um, takers. There's it is a world of change. I think what we should pledge for is a decade of action. You know, that's the thing. Like, this is the year of change, but it's a well, decade of action that we need to I commit to. At the beginning, you are our chief get shit done GSD. So, <laughs> follow yeah, no, your path. Yes, no absolutely. Um, so, Leanne, you mentioned the importance of STEM. I think a lot of people are right with you there, but there are surely lots of people with humanities and arts backgrounds as well. Do they have a role in blockchain? Yeah, critically so. That's why I said we talk about STEM, S-T-E-M, but there's esteem where you take the A into arts and the E with entrepreneurship and esteem, what a great word. So that is actually what makes the harmonious movement. Um, most definitely arts is, um, one of the biggest sectors that was hit here in Australia in COVID was the independent artist sector. 
And of course, there was very little digital platforms in place other than going into the grips and the hands of Spotify. So great, you know, we've seen many different um, a company. I remember so well, Simon Edhouse launched BitTunes and that looked at independent artists on the Bitcoin network. Um, you know, this is an absolute turnkey point for artists across the world. Uh, and then we work in the provenance of art, the physicality of art in the great masters. So most definitely, that's why I was trying to word up esteem. Entrepreneurship, A for arts, let's change STEM. You guys heard it here. Don't call it STEM anymore. It's esteem. I'm right. going to write an article next week for the government. It'll get published and it's about being a STEMinist. So there you well, go. Well, there you go. All right, we'll look out for that. I really like that. Let's include everyone in this. Um, I've got a question here that's we're going to switch to um, the COVID situation because I think this is a, a is an important question so when we think about food we haven't talked a lot about food and agriculture and supply chain um, going on in Australia or other parts of the world where you think you know where we are um, going to see acceleration of the food tracking provenance um, Similar concept, uh, you know, in light of the fact that people are uh, seeing massive global differences on the food supply chain, and especially in the U.S. I mean, that's that's hit hard in certain sectors. Um, can you give us some thoughts around that food agriculture? Yeah, I can. So I think supply chains are looking at value chains and risk chains. And as we've had uh, from a government perspective built incredible defense resiliency around supply chains, but most of that's been in ammunition, you know, frigates, flyers, what have you, helicopters. That kind of defensibility for the nation's security is less about protecting our borders and more so about ensuring that we have enough food, water and shelter. Um, and so we're going to start to see really big government movements now, huge incentive, uh, incentivizations, and it's already beginning uh, in the US. We were on a call last night with advanced manufacturing leads in the world, and there's billions of dollars being poured into places like Michigan for them to now rebirth manufacturing centers. You know, once was the giants of automotive manufacturing, will now start to rethink. From an Australian perspective, you know, we are the food bowl for Asia. So there was a yeah. huge cry out. For whatever reason, the Aussies just bought all that toilet paper went off. I don't, don't understand why when COVID is a respiratory disease, um, I'm sorry, a virus, but for some reason we sold out of toilet paper um, in a pretty quick period of time. But as Australia, given that we're the food bowl for Asia, we can feed seven times our own population. So we are a great big floating island, a tiny continent and a huge island. We closed our borders super quickly, so too did New Zealand. No one will go starving here in Australia um, because we can feed seven times our population. Other parts of the world are so reliant upon food chains because they don't have the agricultural belts that we have here in Australia. Um, what I did see in COVID was super interesting. Um, buying food in the midst of the crisis when we weren't exporting anything out to other parts of the world, the taste of our meats became better. Our seafood felt like it was so much more tastier. So now there's this rising of questions to ask, are we actually doing ourselves a disservice by sending our most premium products overseas into the ASEAN markets or up into, into Europe? So this is a question that's being asked now um, for the prosperity of our nation. Are we actually doing ourselves a disservice by continuously trying to build bigger GDP? Um, so, most definitely supply chain security, risk chains, whether it be uh, in medical or food, um, are going to be, are going to be. It's not an if, it's a when, and the when is now. The issue that's missing is the how. So okay. that's the piece of work that needs to be done. How do we do the transition to these technologies? What are those technologies and who's got it? We did a huge call out in the middle of this as a government and said, we give us a blank canvas. We don't have blank checks, but we got big checks but don't come with ideas. We need solutions, right? We don't need another fancy PowerPoint. We don't need it if then maybe great vision. We need a solution. Show us the solution, we'll write a check. Amazing. Well, with that, the other side of this is someone would like to know, Deepak would like to know, 
what are the potential risks of using blockchain technology for supply chains? We talked a lot about the benefits. What are some of the issues or risks that we do need to consider when implementing um, this level of transparency and provenance to supply chains? The risk is that we only use blockchain. That's the risk to the supply chain because blockchain alone won't solve for provenance. Blockchain alone won't provide for traceability with integrity. It needs to come together as a symphony of technologies with things like, um, uh, in the diamond industry, uh, diamonds are unique by their very nature. So there's various different sciences and scanning technologies that have been used for the majority of the time of industry. That has to be connected and captured into the chain. Um, most definitely data integrity. So the integrity of the data at its source needs to uh, also be um, instantiated and uh, have some oversight over it. Um, I also think that we need to be careful in public private chains, um, the balance between consensus, how that will work, the types of federated models that exist. Is there a slight um, tipping of powers uh, in voting around the governance on chain. So I think that's a very careful line balance to draw. Uh, I wrote up and delivered a keynote at the OECD for blockchain last year and spoke very deeply around the risk of this. The risk is that we have had so many large companies understand the power of this technology, whether it be big banking and finance uh, organizations, whether it be companies that are huge corporates, run into this space, but are they only just rebuilding on chain right. a centralized power um, positioning? And I, and, I, and I fear that the reality is that it is. The other thing that's just occurred is that Amazon, of course, have published its um, patent around provenance for e-commerce using yeah. blockchain. So I feel like it's an awakening a moment of these giants, that, you know, things that we've been involved with for five years that's clearly in the public domain space now they see a huge competitive advantage and are starting to wrap their legal um, arms around this and trying to, in whatever persuasive way, um, you know, use the patentable powers to block out the change. And that, to a certain extent, is not a healthy world to be in. No, and also further to that, uh, I think someone alerted me to the fact that Visa recently had um, a patent awarded related to... Uh, uh, you know, access to fiat currency or digital dollar to that effect, which I still, I would need to look at how that would work. But anyway, um, yes, the big, big institutions are certainly waking up to um, the power of blockchain. They certainly are. Let's, how, let's see how defensible their patents can be, but in any event. Yeah, agree. It, 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 you know, we should take some comfort in it, in that we're not the crazy ones with a crystal ball running around the world chanting and ranting about the future. It's clear that we we're very early in our vision and, and the muscle strength being awarded to all, all of these efforts across this community. Um, and, uh, but I certainly remember the days when MySpace was the first to market, but just because you're first doesn't mean you're the first to scale. So. This is really where the collective power of those that have been in the space long enough needs to say, right, how do we take the collective ecosystem platform marketplace? How do we create this? Um, because it's not about first in market, it's first to scale. First to scale up, first to scale out. Absolutely, I'm right there with you, absolutely. So that actually takes us to uh, an interesting question from Anonymous here. Um, what? do you know now about the industry that you wish you had known when you started your blockchain journey many years ago? <laughs> um, learned worth mentioning? So, I, I, Everledger is interesting. I don't, I've, maybe it's uh, the Australian way, but I sort of operate to a certain extent in a bubble. I don't see myself as a blockchain industry person or a diamond industry person, I see that we're building a platform of provenance. It doesn't exist in the world, that the marketplaces that we're bringing together to bring justifiable value um, in these emerging markets doesn't exist either. So I feel as though um, I'm not necessarily reflecting inward on other industries. I know that I'm taking the best of the challenges and the best of the power of the technology and bringing those together into this new paradigm world. So I wish I could answer that question 
differently and point to, well, in blockchain, if we had these three, but I don't, I don't really look within that. I, I spend a fair bit of time reflecting in the mirror for change and then most of the time looking directly out the window and two hands on the steering wheel, no airbag. Let's, let's do this. <laughs> I like, that's a really interesting <laughs> picture there. I'm picturing it right now. Um, so we are actually closing in on the hour, uh, but I do want to just tuck in one more question from Crystal. Um, she asks about other major industries. Do you see blockchain um, having a role across multi-level of industries? Uh, she gives an example of construction, for example. Look, I am so convinced that the power of what exists within distributed technology should be at its core as a protocol to the web. Just as we have HTTP, SMTP that drives applications like browsers and email, that's the real work to be done. The industry adoption then will become the adoption as you can't ask an industry in the world that doesn't use the internet for something, right? So it should become embedded within policy. We've seen things like the UK government with their Bayes and international in their industrial strategy make a very clear declaration about a hundred year living policy. So beyond the tenure of ministers, because they care about their three year and five year election cycles, and they clearly said AI, artificial intelligence. So if you want public policy money to build a road, it's got to be informed up alongside artificial intelligence. We need that to be embedded within peak body industry um, guiding principles. We need it to be within schools and education. We need it to be within um, W3, right? We need those guys to be embedding this. And then all of a sudden, it is actually digitally ubiquitous. I believe it will get there. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee sitting in W3, knows and understands what needs to be done truly has reflected in the mirror around first generation internet principles. He knows this is the third generation of internet principles. Um, but I, from wherever Ledger sits, you'll see now the last three years for us has been in a parallel universe whilst building diamonds and colored gemstones and luxury goods. And we've done a fantastic job of it. We right. care deeply about the planet. So we care about the economic principles of circular economy. When a sick, this is one, you know, a single use plastic can go into the Great Barrier Reef. We can reuse and repurpose that, refine it, track it as a, a food grade plastic tray. Um, we can do the same thing with tires and enable that not just to be a lower form derivative and throw it into a road or put it into a kid's playground, but you can actually make new products out of that. That's the stuff that I think is really exciting. So not just where does it come from, but where does it go after it leaves me? And that's the big question that burns inside of us. I, I think what you've brought up is a whole nother discussion we need to have at a later date. And I really thank you for that because we don't think we know about the what after we're done with it or what else can we repurpose with it or for it. So thank you very much, Leanne. Do you have any final parting words for us because uh, we're already at the hour. Um, really apologies to those we, whose questions we did not get to, but um, we will send them over to Leanne and hopefully um, you know, the team can answer them. Yeah, I just must say you opened with the letters after my name of GSD and that's certainly a hashtag, but let's say GSD, get stuff done for the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. That brings together the principles of a unitedness and change and that's really the source and the core effort of that social contract we have with each other but also that stakeholder commitment to people and planet so that might sound like I'm hugging a tree um, or patting a polar bear but the reality is this is the decade for action and this year has delivered change at a pretty astonishing rate so for those of you that are sitting on your ass in New York and about to go to sleep, don't, because you've got a bit more work to do before you um, close your eyes tonight. Thanks very much for that, Leanne. I think um, if you all are not inspired, I don't know what will inspire you. So uh, let's get stuff done with Leanne. Thanks very much. Have a good one. And over Thanks, back everyone. To
Thanks, Sandra. I think that was a ripper. It went well. Thank you so much, Leanne. You have a good day. Yeah. Anytime, mate. See you later. Now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna work more. <laughs> Radio. Sleep well. Bye.